Anne Mann is someone whose writing I've uh, long admired, uh, both in the monthly and elsewhere. She uh, was a regular columnist for The Age and The Australian. She's written several books, uh, Motherhood, How We Should Care for Our Children. She wrote a quarterly essay, uh, Love and Money, and um, the memoir, uh, So This Is Life. Uh, her new book, um, The Life of I, The New Culture of Narcissism, is a really fascinating book. It's, a, it's it struck a chord, uh, it's a very, it takes a serious look at a serious problem, but writes it in a way that's really struck a popular chord, I've noticed, around the country over the past month or so. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Anne Mann to the stage. Please welcome her. Oh. I keep getting electric shocks. Um, I would joked earlier, and I'll just repeat it, that a narcissist, when they're criticised, in the psychological laboratory will be far more willing than someone who is not narcissistic to deliver an electric shock. So I'm wondering what the message of me getting all these shocks is. Um, well, look, I wrote The Life of I after uh, beginning an essay uh, many years back, um, somewhere in the mid-2000s, uh, on narcissism. And essentially for me, narcissism was a mystery story. It was a, a puzzle. Uh, and I'd come from writing about uh, care, about uh, how we raise children, and where I'd been much more exploring a connected self. So narcissism for me was to do with uh, a disconnected self, where instead of the, um, the nature of, say, parental love, where the lovers turn towards the child, uh, this is love where it's turned inward. So I was, I was trying to unravel the, the why um, of narcissism, uh, what it was, and uh, what the consequences were. But I was always interested in much more than narcissism in the individual. The uh, holy grail for me was always the greater puzzle, the greater mystery, which was, um, as Christopher Lash put it in his very early book in 1979 called The Culture of Narcissism, uh, he said, the prevailing culture brings out narcissism in all of us. And so he was really interested in the question of how the individual psyche was shaped by the larger culture. And so in my book, I wanted to do two things. Once, one was to unravel in a very uh, close up, um, intimate way, how narcissism comes about in the individual uh, and to do so through stories um, as much as through the theoretical or empirical um, uh, literature, uh, but also to look at this larger question of narcissism in the, in, in the larger society. So the book is divided into two parts, and the first part is about narcissism and the individual, and the second is narcissism and the, uh, the society. Uh, but I also wanted to understand in the second part some of the things which really puzzled me, um, which I'll come to a little later in my talk, but just one of them was, for example, why Last year, when we were uh, briefly the wealthiest uh, country in the world, um, because the Australian dollar was very high at that point, we're now one of the wealthiest, uh, we were at this very same moment thinking about reducing our foreign aid. And there was a great raft of things that we were saying we couldn't afford. Um, so uh, it seemed to me that at the level of culture, there was a whole problem in, as, as to you know, why we would have that kind of behaviour. In the first part of the book, um, in the, the first chapter, um, I talk about the story of Anders Breivik, and he's the Norwegian uh, young man who was a mass killer uh, of 69 people in uh, Norway. And he was, uh, was immediately a, a riveting um, story as the most terrible uh, case of where he um, first had a bomb, um, where he killed eight people in Oslo, then he went to an island of Utøya where he proceeded to mow down um, 69 uh, young people. And they were young leftists. They were the flower of um, young uh, left-wing uh, political youth in Norway. And that was quite deliberate because he had, was, he had a whole manifesto, a 1,500-page manifesto that he'd released at the same time, where he felt that Europe was... Um, being marauded by the Islamic infidel, but was also being 
undermined and white anted by what he called cultural Marxism. And amongst the uh, kind of criminals were um, the uh, feminists who he thought were undermining uh, patriarchy. Um, there was a, a, a hatred of uh, left-wing thought, um, and that was you know, why he had chosen this particular group um, of, of people, particularly um, to, to kill. And I just want to read um, a little bit at the end in a moment uh, to show one of the things which struck me in the research I did on narcissism of this extreme self-focus. And now Breivik's a, you know, a, a very pathological case, a very extreme case, but the reason I chose him was that uh, often in extreme cases you can see in stark outline the nub of uh, the problem. At first there was a great controversy about his crime because people thought it was uh, schizophrenia, or the forensic psychiatrist who first assessed him. But then there was a furor over this because in fact his manifesto was cogent, um, his actions were really carefully planned, um, most people with schizophrenia are not violent, uh, there was none of the kind of word salad or disintegrative aspects of um, schizophrenia. And so it wasn't long before forensic psychiatrists began to dispute it and then people examining him uh, said, no, no, this is in fact uh, a new character type. This is the most extreme narcissist we have ever seen. And so I just um, want to uh, now read uh, from the very end of uh, the first chapter uh, just to show his the kind of self-focus. So he's just arrested at the end of this crime where he's slaughtered all these young people. And he's chased them all around the island. Some of them have tried to swim away. He's shot them when they uh, swam uh, into the very cold waters. Uh, some of them died because of the cold. He uh, would chase them to from one end of the island uh, to the other. And he chose his bullets very carefully. They were dum-dum bullets which would explode in the body. So he's standing on this island littered with corpses. When Breivik was arrested, he held up a finger. It had a small cut on it. He stood on an island littered with 69 shattered and bloodied corpses. Yet as the policeman handcuffed him, he held up that finger. He wanted a band-aid. He was really intent, said the policeman later, on getting himself that band-aid. When the second team of psychiatrists ruled that Anders Breivik suffered from an extreme narcissistic personality disorder and was responsible for his actions and should stand trial, Breivik was triumphant. Here was the chance he had hoped for, standing centre stage in front of the world's cameras, avoiding what he called the humiliation of being dismissed as mad. Breivik arrived at the court handcuffed and smiling. He raised his fist in a far-right salute. At first he displayed no emotion apart from that smirk. He was indifferent to the descriptions of his victims' last call to their loved ones and to the detailed descriptions of their mutilated bodies. He did not weep at the memory of the sound of the victim's screams, nor at the gasps from their grief-stricken families as they heard him coldly relate the circumstances of his killings nor did he flinch at the enormity of what he had done. The deaths of all those young people were merely collateral damage in the war of his imagining. Describing his act as spectacular, the embedding of spectators in that phrase is revealing, he bragged he would do it all over again. Yet there was something at the trial which made him tremble with emotion. His face fell, the tears welled up and rolled down his cheeks. What made Breivik weep was his own rhetoric, as his video manifesto was played in court. What moved him was the sound of his own words. As Breivik began his 21-year sentence, he complained about his cruel and inhuman treatment. In one of the most humane prison systems of the world, Breivik did not take long to feel aggrieved. He was not getting the treatment he felt entitled to. His cell lacked a good view. The version of PlayStation given to him was too old. The heating wasn't turned up high enough and his coffee was served too cold. Now while Breivik uh, was a, a very revealing uh, and uh, extreme case to begin with, 
most of the work on narcissism and indeed the uh, aspects of narcissism that interest many people is much more what you'd call uh, in the subclinical uh, variety. It's just the ordinary person who's a jerk around the office, um, who is a, uh, a real problem in a family, uh, who is marked by uh, the following characteristics. It, it's not just an ordinary uh, form of selfishness even, and they're you know, subclinical and quite ordinary variety. It's marked by uh, a lack of empathy, uh, a sense of entitlement, uh, a willing to exploit others, and a, quite a grandiose sense of themselves. So that in that grandiosity, there's a sense of being very special, so that many of the other aspects of willingness to exploit someone and the uh, sense of entitlement uh, flows from that sense of being superior to others. Um, and it is a, it's not just a high self-esteem, but it's a self-esteem which is based on being uh, superior uh, to others. There's um, constant self-enhancement. Um, one person put it as constructing the self as if it's on quicksand. So there's an anxiety there as well. There's a fragility to that person. Uh, and that was uh, certainly true um, of, of Breivik at the extreme, but it's true of, of many of those who um, show up as, as narcissists, that uh, in, essentially they are uh, inflated by pride, uh, but deflated by shame. They're forever scrabbling for the higher ground um, in a social setting. Um, they're, off, they're willing to alienate other people by bragging rather than... Uh, trying to um, get along with someone else. And um, to use the title of another really good study on, on, on the narcissist, um, that their relation to other people is, it has been distorted in the direction of the self. Like every, everyone will have moments of selfishness, moments of complete forgetfulness of someone else if they're in a temper, um, if they're sick or they're in some way uh, uh, really preoccupied by a great problem. That, but this is a, a much more stable state. Um, and it's, the, it's caught in the title of this uh, very good article called Others Exist for Me. So that the relation to the other person is distorted. Uh, Martin Buber, the philosopher, had a way of looking at that long before there was any empirical psychological literature on narcissism. And he said that, you know, the ideal is to have a relationship to someone else of the I and the thou, you know, where you are equals. Um, to one subject speaking to another subject. But the distortion for Buber, as he put it, was that someone could have the relationship to another person of the I and the it. So the person becomes an object. And people who are in contact with a narcissist will feel um, squeezed and uh, often uh, used up. Uh, Otto Kernberg put it that the, uh, when you are at the receiving end of someone who is very narcissistic, you feel uh, like a, a lemon that has been squeezed and then the remains, that, you know, all the remains that's been discarded. Um, so the, you know, the great question was, um, part of the, the, the mystery that I was trying to solve was um, how, you know, wh wh how is this created and, you know, what really um, is, is the, the cause. And there's uh, two essential uh, positions about narcissism and I discuss that debate in my book. And one is that, in essence, this person is every bit as bad as they seem. They're, as I call it, just a jerk. There's nothing more complex there. And uh, that's put out by some really influential social psychologists in America, Jean Twenge and uh, uh, Keith Campbell. And they wrote a book uh, called uh, The Narcissism Epidemic, but also, it's, which is a popular book, but they're also very serious scholars. Uh, and so they argued that, in fact, the the tradition of psychoanalysis, which had argued something quite different, that the narcissist was actually extremely fragile and insecure underneath, and uh, what they said was, you know, there was a mask around uh, this quite um, uh, fragile and, and um, uncertain self. Uh, they are arguing, that uh, this is the, the social psychologist, that in fact it's, it's much simpler, that this person is just obnoxious, um, and this person is actually quite oblivious of others and overconfident. And they based their work on the, the, a new measure which um, uh, was developed in the 1990s. All the earlier work was done by psychoanalysts and it was really on a case-by-case -case basis. And so they built up a portrait via the person on their couch. So it was built up from the individual. 
this was large, um, much more mass studies, and they found that, uh, for example, in American college students, it increased by 30% from the years 1979 to 2007. So that's quite a significant in increase. The particular psychological measure, measure they were using was called the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. And it has things like, um, I am an extraordinary person versus I'm pretty much like everyone else. Or if I ruled the world, it would be a better place versus um, you know, ruling the world would scare the hell out of me. Um, and uh, I take my satisfactions pretty much as they come versus I'm determined to get the respect I deserve. And it's interesting that amongst mass killers, often there's a prior humiliation just to the, uh, prior to the killing, but also, um, say, the, uh, with the Columbine killers, they actually used almost the exact phrase from the narcissistic personality inventory uh, that I'm determined to get the respect I deserve. They said, you know, we're going to get the dis respect we deserve. Um, but central to this new way of thinking from this empirical evidence was the fact that there's been tremendous uh, belief that if you raise children and if we are as adults, then the most important thing is to have self-esteem. I'm sure all of you will have encountered this idea. You just have to love yourself enough and everything will fall into place. And this is a really major challenge to it because essentially the... Uh, evidence was showing the particularly high and unstable self-esteem, you know, the threatened egotist, is a really dangerous person to be around um, at the extremes and even in ordinary life when they're criticised um, they turn pretty nasty as well as electric shocks. They're willing to give anyone who criticises them in the lab a, um, a blast of really loud aversive noise. So, you know, translated to ordinary life, this means someone who has, you know, not just a hissy fit, but a, a major meltdown, um, and often really uncontrolled rage. So the problems of being able to um, control their emotions whenever they're um, threatened and, and um, criticised. So there's a, there's a major challenge which has been thrown out to the way we think about how we raise children, um, how we think about ourselves as adults as to whether the cause is really low self-esteem. Um, there was quite a lot of work done on crime showing that uh, from rapists to other criminals there is often uh, too high self-esteem and they had too high opinions of themselves. Uh, one of the examples I give in my book is uh, from uh, the literature on sexual narcissism and on sexual aggression. And there it was uh, fascinating to read that incarcerated rapists would often deny even that, it had, that the sex that they'd had was rape. So they were more willing to admit murder than they were to admit rape because it was more humili humiliating to actually admit um, that they'd been involved in, uh, had, they'd had to force a woman. And they might say things like, um, uh, I've never, one person who'd done multiple rapes said, I've never had anyone say no to me. Um, and another one said, uh, I don't know why they never rang back. Um, so there's a kind of, uh, again, we're getting to uh, something that is really interesting about the way someone with a high, high, you know, these are quite, ex um, you know, th these are more severe, but a high degree of narcissism is in a state of denial. Um, and so the normal, you know, checks and balances on the way we encounter reality, um, our normal capacity to self-reflect and draw back from, uh, you know, where, as Freud put it, you know, the wish becomes reality, um, is, is really missing. Uh, However, when I looked at this particular argument about uh, the nature of narcissism, it seemed to me there was a lot more evidence than the uh, leading scholars were admitting about uh, the essential insecurity and fragility, uh, especially amongst young people um, who were showing up um, more highly in narcissism. Uh, so I looked then very carefully at the psychoanalytic arguments um, and uh, the, the argument which is being floating around, you've probably, uh, quite a lot of people have heard it, that it's essentially spoiling and helicopter parenting. Um, I didn't really find the, the uh, was the case. I didn't only look at Bravik, I looked at a number of uh, different uh, case studies for the book um, because I thought it was better to uh, tell what narcissism was like through, uh, through those stories. Um, and in almost, you know, um, just, uh, just with absolute reliability, it was always a very particular kind of a childhood 
which partly had uh, people who were tuned out a lot of the time, but who tuned in particularly around questions of ach achievement. So that it was, um, as one uh, psychoanalyst put it, I thought rather well, uh, these are children who, you know, they might be showered with material goods, but there's not a real attentiveness when the child needs it. It's more somehow s the attention is serving the needs of the parent. Um, so there's both coldness, but at the same time, there's also a lot of indulgence. It might be split between two parents where you have one uh, parent, the father, let's say, in the case of um, Breivik and Lance Armstrong, who I'll come to in a moment, um, who was uh, either very cold uh, or abandoning. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, but on the other hand, a, <coughs> sorry, a mother who was extremely indulgent and set uh, absolutely no boundaries whatsoever. Uh, so the simple argument which is coming out of particularly the US, uh, and wh which I think has a, to me, quite a Republican feel, you know, it's just indulgence, it's just spoiling, it's all the individual and so on, um, was not as well supported in the evidence um, as um, I was you know, trying to solve this uh, mystery story for myself as I, as I first thought might be the case. Uh, so I then turned to uh, the attachment literature, which I knew really well, and that's essentially about the bonding that occurs in very early childhood. And I knew that a lot of the qualities of narcissist maps across um, insecure attachment uh, to um, the parents. And one of them is called, uh, most important, is called avoidant attachment. And it, in the adult form, is that these people become very dismissing of emotion, quite hostile to dependency in themselves and others. And uh, they are very self-enhancing. Uh, now, I'm not saying everyone with such an attachment um, becomes a narcissist, but nonetheless, clearly, this is a, a good place to start. Um, secure attachments, on the other hand, are really notable for the way that they create uh, empathy in children and, you know, as going on through uh, school, adolescence and adulthood. And empathy is really uh, the opposite of narcissism, you know, the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes, the ability to take another person's perspective. Um, so it's the... Um, uh, and, and it's a way of placing oneself on an equal footing. And I want to give just an, um, an amusing example because I've given you a lot of rather... Um, <laughs> rather um, uh, terrible ones so far. But uh, a, a lot of the literature in, in, uh, on, on narcissism is actually quite um, amusing. And this one, it, this business of, you know, it's, it's not self-esteem where the person believes that they are equal to another. The crucial aspect is that they believe that they're superior to the other person or other people. So that they're always placing themselves in a, um, a higher position. And this is an example from Kanye West, who's, well, everyone knows him. Okay. People get mad at me saying that I'm a creative genius, but it's just obvious. It's like factual. I would write creative genius when I go through the airport. I would put that on the custom forms where you put what your title is, except for two reasons. It takes too long to write, and sometimes I spell the word genius wrong. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, another um, amusing example that I came across was um, one of the interesting things about the is, is about uh, the narcissist in love. And whereas most people, when you form an attachment to someone, that person becomes precious to you and you're, it's not easily replaceable. Um, and therefore, you are not, uh, n you know, notwithstanding the. Um, the confusions of early relationships and the, the general muddle which exists in, amongst young people and so on as they find their, uh, the, the people that they can be close to. But this is a really predictable and consistent pattern going right through life, such as they will form a relationship but uh, always be somewhat withholding so that uh, they're game-playing, essentially. They're always looking around for something better at the same time as being in and keeping the, the and getting the benefits from a stable uh, and committed relationship. So, the, so the game is to get the other person to be committed, and to um, give them the benefits of stability and love and um, and so on. But they yeah, uh, are, are cheating. 
uh, and serial cheaters, not just something where you know a relationship doesn't work out and um, you you move to, to um, another relationship or fall in love with someone else. This is a you know kind of serial pattern. Anyway, the one of the researchers that I was speaking about earlier wrote this book um, because it is um, uh, uh, more noticeable in in amongst males. But it's called um, uh, "When You Love a Man Who Loves um, Himself." And it was really based on a series of plaintive letters that came to him uh, because they knew he was researching narcissism and so they thought they should, um, uh, he, you know, the, the, uh, these, these people thought that he would be able to give them the answer as to what had happened. Uh, so he wrote this rather uh, popular book for such people. But in it, one of the examples is someone who had a photo of himself by the bedside. Um, and uh, he used to kiss that good night. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, I think I'm, oh, we better start the conversation. But um, uh, I, um, in the, the rest of the conversation, I think it'd be, it'd be good if we discuss the, the broader cultural uh, kinds of issues. But anyway. And man. <clears throat> And you, you first wrote about narcissism in, in 2006 in an essay. What, what was it that brought you back to this subject uh, to write a book? And, and what was it in the literature that was missing that you wanted to address? Because there have yes. been, there, there's, I mean, there's, you have a, an abbreviated list of the sorts of titles that have been written about narcissism over recent years. There mm. really are a lot of them. It's a, it's a hot topic. Mm. But, um, but you've added something else to it. What, what were you sort of aiming for? Uh, well, partly I didn't feel in that first article I had solved the problem for myself. Mm -hmm. I had read a lot and I gave um, what one psychoanalyst told me was a classical version <laughs> of, uh, which was the psychodynamic view, you know, that the person was uh, actually vulnerable. But I, I wasn't entirely convinced myself. Uh, and I think that the first uh, version was quite playful. Uh, it amused me a lot more back then. And then I started reading <laughs> and it amused me and it, it amuses me a lot less um, now because I, I see it essentially as something that um, is so damaging. Uh, but the, the other thing is, is I have had a long concern with the turn our society took in uh, you know, the 1980s essentially uh, to a much more competitive um, economy to um, a you know, free market economy, the, the great leap forward into neoliberalism. Um, but what has really interested me about that has been that all economies carry with them a kind of cultural logic. So they have um, uh, a social ecology which attaches to them. And I have felt that the social ecology, um, it, it, you know, for all that we are doing some things to mitigate um, the uh, you know the effects of, of um, neoliberalism on uh, so the question I've been most concerned with, which is care, like paid parental leave and so on, uh, that in fact there was uh, a corrosion of character going on, and it was something that people weren't choosing, but that was occurring because of the the, the you know the, the logic of events. So I was really interested in the whole second half of the book to deal with uh, people like Anne Rand. Um, who I began to, I had earlier in my life dismissed her as a kind of kook, um, and I still think she's a kook, but I think she's a really influential kook. Uh, and she clearly has a real ideology of narcissism that is immensely attractive to many, many people. Um, yeah, and, and as you rightly point out, it's a, it's a extremely influential ideology, but that it pays really no attention to, to uh, the human aspects of, of you know, our social relations. What, tell us about Ayn Rand's own life because it's a fascinating... Her, her own life really stands as an example of the failure of, of neoliberalism, of the ideas that she mm. put forward. Yes, well, she, uh, she, she first became uh, exceptionally pro-capitalist in a way that uh, is quite extreme. For example, she wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness um, and that title tells you a lot about the sort of ideology she wrote... A, a paper and gave it to when she was um, uh, in her 80s called The Sanction of the Victims. And the victims she was talking to and about were the wealthiest American businessmen. And she actually believed that they were the victims of the whole society. So uh, she'd come from communism. She'd uh, had her family destroyed in Soviet Russia. Um, she'd been 
hailed by her family as a kind of child prodigy. Um, so, but it was a very cold family as well. There's, there's again this uh, pattern of, of coldness and indulgence at the same time. Uh, but she saw the ruination of her father and her family. So wherever she saw the state, even when she was um, moving to a democracy, uh, she saw communism and uh, the, the Gulag Archipelago, you know, she saw. Mm. Uh, so she misunderstood in the most monumental and grotesque way. Uh, but she also had um, an ideology of the self, which I think is really uh, interesting. Um, I'll just read the first, um, just little quote uh, from uh, her own writing. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's so revealing and it seemed to me that he was, um, you know, for the first time, a popular ideology of narcissism. And you have to remember that her books uh, are not only international bestsellers but an incredible number of Americans have read them and most importantly um, one of her acolytes in this little kind of cult she had formed around her uh, was Alan Greenspan who presided over uh, the enormous changes in and the reforms, like the Glass-Steagall Act in the US, which then were the preface to the global financial crisis. Um, so this is what she, this is her philosophy. I am done with the monster of we, the world of serfdom, of plunder, of misery, falsehood and shame. And now I see the face of God and I raise this God over the earth, this God whom men have sought since men have come into being, this God will grant them joy and peace and pride. This God, this one word, I. Uh, anyway, so here she is. She comes to America. She, as she put it, wept tears of splendour as she saw, you know, the um, uh, the, the outline of, of um, uh, you know, America. She, uh, however, uh, all of her ideology is about independence. She has this, which is very pertinent to Australia, as Joe Hockey puts forward the idea of the leaners and the lifters, um, she put forward the idea of the producers and the parasites. So in her novels, the heroes are the producers, the creators, and the parasites are the enemy. They're people who you know, want state help or they're people who are somehow going to tear others down, um, the looters, the moochers, and the, the parasites. Mm. So that it, you know, when we hear Joe Hockey talking about the leaners and lifters, that is the Australian branding, I think, of Anne Rand's uh, idea. However, it's so interesting about her life because she, you know, first of all, just to give you a flavour of her character, she um, decided she was uh, sexually interested in Nathaniel Brandon, who, by the way, was be became the first person to really push the whole self-esteem movement, which I found a rather delicious irony, but nonetheless. Um, so she, and he was, he was a, a much younger man. He um, had a, um, he was married to, they both were. But anyway, she announced to the um, spouses that they were going to meet um, for sex on Thursday afternoons or, or whatever it was. Um, and this arrangement went on and it had a, you know, quite a destructive consequence for both of the spouses who were not given a choice about the matter. He was a, um, and he, her employee, he was her um, junior. You know, it was a power relationship is what I'm saying. And then when he tired of the relationship, um, she, her philosophy was called objectivism. And she was, I'm afraid, anything but objective. And she then, um, she accused him and had him, rather like the Stalinist purge, purged from um, this little cult uh, so that he uh, was accused of, you know, poor philosophy and uh, <laughs> false reasoning and so on. But the most interesting thing about her life, um, and by the way, one of those jettisoning um, this poor um, man was um, Alan Greenspan. He, he went ahead with... Uh, uh, making sure that um, this man was expelled from the group. But um, with uh, her final life, you know, final part of her life, she became ill and then she realised, as her husband did as well with cancer, that she could not in neoliberal America, this America she'd celebrated, that she'd promulgated and, and been such an advocate of, could not afford healthcare. So she had to go on to Medicare and re receive social security. So the, the kind of fraudulence of this whole philosophy is shown because actually all of us are, are vulnerable at some point in our life and particularly old age is not is inescapable. We seem to have lost the language to some extent in public discourse of talking about uh, care and compassion as part of the, uh, the this sort of society, the system that we live in, as in uh, you talked about uh, Joe Hockey's speaking of the end of the age of entitlement. It seems rare even that politicians 
will now even mount a case for the worth of taxation generally as, as a sort of social necessity and they seem to have abandoned the idea of the common good in, in, in favour of speaking about the hip pocket. Are these the, the, sorts, of, um, the sorts of elements that um, you think lead to narcissism or is it a, is it a, a relationship that's symbiotic? Uh, well, I think um, symbiotic. However, I do think that political leadership is enormously important and I'll, I'll give um, uh, an example. There's some really interesting work on narcissism and wealth and inequality done by um, a psychologist called Paul Piff. And he found that, uh, he started off with sort of quite basic experiments, um, but he, he found that, for example, when he positioned researchers by crossroads, people in later model and more expensive cars would fail to give way to other cars in which were less um, salubrious, you know, the, the, the battered Toyota Corolla, um, by uh, an order of four to one. So they're, they're four times less likely to give way. Uh, ditto uh, pedestrians. So, you know, you need to really look carefully as you're walking across the next um, zebra crossing uh, at three times less likely. So then he went on and he kept looking at it. And through lots and lots of studies, not only of college population, but the general um, community as well, he found that the wealthier people were, uh, the less likely they were to give to charity. Um, they, the, the richest Americans were giving less to charity as a percentage of their income than poorer people. He found that they were more likely in the laboratory to cheat if they were placed in a position of being an employer. Uh, and he found that uh, it, the central issue uh, with their behaviour was always an increased sense of entitlement. And if people will recall, as I was introducing narcissism, one of the central aspects is a sense of entitlement, mm. you know, that you're better than others. And it was very easy to manipulate it so that people quite quickly would be able to be made to feel that they were better than others and therefore they were entitled to, take, say, take lollies out of a jar that was designed for children or mm. uh, whatever the particular test was. But I guess, you know, one uh, grounds for hope was it was also easy to manipulate the other way so that people who were primed, say, with a picture of a child in poverty could behave much more empathetically. So, you know, that um, to me was highly interesting in the light of, for example, you know, in Australian politics you can see lots of different impulses and one is certainly, <coughs> excuse me, Joe Hockey's budget, but at the same time we can also see the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme where we were primed for empathy, I guess, during yeah, that whole yeah. campaign. There's also there's there's been a strain in this conversation uh, in the discussion of narcissism around the uh, the power of social media. Do, do you think social media has? Are you uh, do you believe that social media has supercharged the kind of tendencies that that uh, you know that consumer capitalism uh, has brought about in in this regard? Uh, well, I I actually think that that it's more that social media will bring out narcissism in susceptible people. Uh, I'm not uh, as concerned about it as some other people. I mean, I, <laughs> um, I, and I became actually less interested in both social media as one of the suspects and in, uh, I was also less interested in celebrity culture, although clearly they are um, what are called super spreaders of mm. narcissism. Um, celebrities are, have been shown, you know, to be much more narcissistic than other people in the, um, the people who've studied them and so on. But I think it acts more as a megaphone to narcissism that's already there. So I don't think that people would use um, Facebook and Twitter the, the, in a narcissistic way if they were not narcissistic. However, I think there's something fundamental about the change in consciousness where you are not seeing your life as they did in previous centuries, under the eyes of a, uh, eye of God, but under the eyes of peers. Yeah. And so that is a fundamental shift. Something I found fascinating, uh, if you think about um, looking at the statistics of narcissism, I mean, a lot of the statistics come out of the states, but uh, something that I found surprising was that the levels of narcissism um, among young males are a lot higher than among females. Now, if you look at popular culture and the, the discourse around mm. popular culture and advertising, you'd say it's, it's, you know, it's women who are presented as being the ones who are obsessed with their appearance and, and who have mm. fragile psyches based on these things. But in fact, narcissism mm. is, is much uh, more strongly, it much uh, more strongly affects young men. How, how did, how's mm. that explained? 
Uh, very easily. <laughs> um, if you just think about what I was saying about entitlement um, and social dominance uh, and what flows from that, um, I, a lot of the thinking about women and narcissism comes from Freud mm. and a very patriarchal era. Uh, but there's no evidence that they are more narcissistic than males. However, I'm not uh, um, in any way suggesting that it's a biological manifestation. Rather, you know, prevailing cultural conditions bring it out in susceptible people so that um, when you uh, have a position of social dominance, you are more likely to uh, be narcissistic. Um, and so uh, women are actually catching up to men. So as equality happens, the, the uh, rates of, of narcissism are also um, rising slightly. I, I do have to say that d just to slightly counter all of it, if you think about women historically, is also true that they actually need to build up their sense of entitlement mm. um, in the sense of the public realm to claim a space for it. Um, and I think there was a lot of um, uh, reactance against uh, Julia Gillard for, uh, Gillard, for example, because they're it w not just in the person themselves who is female, but in the, uh, the population reacting to them. Uh, there's often not an acceptance in the same way there is of men of social dominance, of leadership, of, um, you know, being in charge of being the, the head honcho, mm -hmm. so to speak. It's, it's, there's a very, I mean, uh, the, the gender issue, it's a very complex one because, as you say, the changes in labour relations over the past 30 or 40 years, the, how they've changed care, um, the way uh, care relationships in families and how... Uh, women are spending a lot more time in work than you know than they used to. It, uh, there's a lot more childcare, uh, and how this affects the parents are spending less time with their children. Essentially, this sort of thing has affected the levels of narcissism as well. I think you you, you sort of make that point fairly strongly. Well, I, I actually do, look. Um, I, I don't exactly put it like that because I didn't feel that narcissism maps over any of the debates that we've had about working or, <coughs> excuse me, not working, uh, or about, um, <coughs> excuse me, no, it's, it's winter, so <laughs> we've all got <coughs> viruses and chokes, uh, about uh, sole parents versus intact families. Where essentially, the narcissistic process is inside um, that family, no matter what, you right. know, the form. Um, d just if I could, just before I come to, uh, to those issues, though, about care, um, I just want to say a little more about bodily narcissism. There's tremendous interest in that and there's a lot more exhibitionism that is possible through Facebook and so on. And we have um, great exemplars like Kim Kardashian uh, as, and uh, where the body seems to be everything. However, this was one of the areas where I really felt that the assumption that it's just something nasty and noxious was underestimating the degree of insecurity and uh, fragility which is in a lot of the expression uh, of you know obsession with appearance um, two examples in the 90 uh, there's a there's a very interesting historian who's written a book called the body project where she looked at the diaries of girls in the um, 1890s and compared them with diaries of girls in the 1990s and she found that in the 1890s they were talking about things like character and they had to improve you know whether they were nice to Aunt Bessie or <laughs> they were um, it really it was it was a project of character that they were involved with and it was a, a life was a moral kind of narrative in the 1990s the moral narrative was still there there's a lot of anxiety about being good but being good enough to look at so all the uh, discussion was about having a makeover, getting thin, um, how you looked and tremendous anxiety you know, about the body. Um, and so there is one manifestation of narcissism is plastic surgery rates. Um, to just give a, a, a quick figure, Australians spend something like 300, 300 million a year on going across to Thailand, Malaysia and so on to get plastic surgery makeovers. Um, in the US, uh, breast augmentation is a really popular high school graduation gift now from parents. Um, and I noticed in Bob Carr's book, he was talking about all these politicians who were dashing off for their plastic surgery. And it becomes a kind of norm, you know, and it's just like, you know, you're going to have perfect white teeth now. And, you know, you, it's sort of once other people start to set a, a community standard. 
And so when I looked at the plastic surgery, there's no doubt that there's a lot of narcissism which is involved, but I was really struck by one piece in one of the um, weekend supplements where the women in question had just had a marriage breakdown and they'd raised four kids and the, you know, the, the marriages had come to an end. So they went across to Thailand, they had all this you know, breast whatever happened and you know the liposuction is on they came home 11 pounds lighter 11 kilos lighter and they had not lost their luggage they'd actually had it all sucked away um, but what struck me really was the vulnerability mm. you know so it's what i call the free market of bodies so that's what i was trying to say before is that that this is a much more insecure world um, and so i don't think that any account of narcissism is adequate um, and that's what I was, one of the things I was trying to bring to this book was to keep ghosting all the way along um, and drawing people back to a sense um, that may not um, uh, be the case that this person's just a, um, a person who's going to respond to being loved more or um, being made less insecure. But it is certainly true <clears throat> that fragility is a tremendously important part of this story. But um, when, I, and I, when I was reading your book, Something struck me and I just wanted to ask you about it. I was watching a press conference of Scott Morrison talking about uh, asylum seekers and he used all the language of intense narcissism to describe the situation. So the victims in his portrayal were us. Mm. So we are the victims of boat people's illegal invasions. Now, there was a complete absence of empathy for other human beings. There's the overblown entitled sense of ourselves and our own fragility and problems out of all proportion to what the refugees were dealing with. There was a, wilf there's a willful misreading of emotional cues uh, and, and the cheating out of recognised obligations and principles. Uh, and, mm. and finally, like an overwhelming, <coughs> overweening sense of pride in, in mm. results. We stopped the boats, etc. Um, of course, he's not speaking for everyone in, in this room and, and in, in Australia, but the sad fact is a lot of Australians would support his position. So my question is, do you think a society can become collectively narcissistic? Well, I would argue that it has. You know, that's really my thesis. Um, and in fact, I, I, you know, I think that it, if you think about, not about what we as human beings might like, but about what this form of new capitalism needs, it needs narcissism. Uh, we know that narcissists buy more. We know that they are much more materialistic. Um, we know that their fragility goes into relentless pursuit um, of um, you know, the, the material accoutrements of life and so on. Um, but I, what I do think, though, however, is, is that it's a very mixed picture. Mm. Uh, and so that while you can see real cruelty in relation to what the way we treat asylum seekers, and that's a terrific description, by the way, and that was one of the things which interested me about narcissism, it is that it's a, a really useful framework to clarify what is going on. It can name something. And, uh, you know, you do, I think you gave a really good description of what um, Scott Morrison is doing. But it's not the only impulse in Australia. So that's why I think that while it makes all sorts of challenges, whether it's asylum seekers, and I talk in the book about climate change and how a society that is more narcissistic is going to be less willing to ta tackle the really big challenge of, of, um, of climate change. Um, but it is not a done deal. No, it's not. And it's clear, clearly from the public response to the recent budget, that sense of yes. uh, anger at the, at the inequities of it, I think it shows that you know, we, there is still a great sense of uh, uh, understanding underlying, you know, even deeper than what the political uh, class would, would sort of yes. want. There, there is still uh, a sense uh, that people actually still understand that societies are more than just market economies. It's like we've been, we, you know, we're being constituted as subjects mm. and have been for some time as a neoliberal subject, you might say, or as I would put it, you know, we have been cultivated, our narcissism has been cultivated. Every election, politicians will stand up. The earlier point you make about taxation is uh, that, you know, we, instead of saying, look, if we want uh, good schools, if we want hospitals where you don't get golden staff, if you want... Um, a health system that um, cares for you also when you're elderly and so on, um, that will cost a certain amount. And in other words, giving what Freud called a reality principle, uh, which 
uh, is, is not an unreasonable thing for politicians to do, that the common the commons is protected by taxation. Mm. It, of course, it, it needs to be prudently um, utilised by government and uh, soberly and carefully done. But nonetheless, um, so that there's a, 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 there's been a you know a fundamental shift. It, it, it's it's okay to say something needs to be done if it appeals to the self. Um, you know, the, the self has become the, you know, what is good for the self is good, and that just isn't the case. You know, sometimes the we basic, have to do things that are, yeah, are not good for the yeah. self. Yeah, and as you say, the basic uh, unit is, uh, is, is no longer the person, it's the working person, as if the people that don't work are not sort of worthy of being uh, considered political subjects. Mm. Uh, questions? There's one down the front here. Uh, thank you for a fascinating address. Uh, you mentioned Lance Armstrong before, as we're in the final week of the current Tour oh, de yes. France, which was uh, Lance's uh, stage. Could you just make a few comments about uh, mm, mm. Lance Armstrong? Well, I have a whole chapter on Lance Armstrong. I have to admit, I, we're, my husband and I are mad Tour de France fans. <laughs> uh, watch it every July. We st partly started because Cadell Evans trained just near us, where we live. and Anyway, so we became very interested in it. Um, it was one of the most pleasurable, um, as well as the darkest, um, uh, phases of my life while writing the book. But Lance Armstrong was uh, just... It, uh, um, he was a complete... Uh, hailed as a citizen saint. Um, he was... Uh, he had a testicular cancer, and he, it turned out that that was because he'd had actually been doping and he was using steroids. But... Uh, he, at the time that he was in his heyday winning seven Tour de France's, I don't know if other, the rest of the audience knows, but the Tour de France is the most extraordinary marathon feat of human beings, I think, of, it, of any um, sporting endeavour. It's over three weeks. It's over the mountains of Italy and mainly um, France, but also often goes into Italy. Um, it's extraordinarily beautiful to watch um, these tiny little thin riders with uh, arms like matchsticks uh, ride up these great mountains and uh, they do it, you know, all day, every day, and it's just the most astonishing feat. Uh, but Armstrong actually changed the character of the Tour de France, whereby everybody either um, had to keep up by doping uh, to keep up with him or, and, and his team, or alternatively, um, they were completely exhausted, often their health ruined, and however naturally talented, they couldn't keep up. The pace actually increased about 22% during the time that he was... Uh, dominating with his doping, and once the authorities got on to the um, uh, to the EPO, which he was using, which boosts oxygen in the blood, um, it was originally uh, used for medical reasons, and but um, sports people who wanted to cheat took to it. Uh, when they really cracked down on it, he then turned to blood transfusions. So you would have these grisly scenes whereby he, he would have had blood as his US team um, had it extracted earlier uh, when it was at the peak of training and they were in incredibly good health. And then when they were absolutely depleted in the middle of the Tour de France at key intervals, they would lie in a hotel room or in their bus and they'd have these blood bags taped on the wall and it'd be pumping into them. Um, and then they'd get up and after a few days they'd be kind of skipping and dancing while all the other play all the other riders who had not um, so it, it was a complete corruption of the Tour de France um, and a lot, then people who tried to out him this is a typical of the narcissist were defamed and threatened and stalked and you know so it was a whole extraordinarily ugly story as the very courageous journalists and a few of the um, uh, uh, one of the wives of the other riders and uh, a masseuse, um, one of the people in the, his, um, who'd been looking after his uh, physical well-being, tried to expose him. Uh, so it was a, a really interesting story of seeing a narcissist at work. The interesting part about the Lan Lance Armstrong, uh, it's, the part of, about narcissism that I think is less well understood is that level of anger Mm. The aggression that um, that underlies the pride, I think yes. he's the he's the perfect kind of example of that. Yeah, yeah. At the back there. I realise I'm running a bit of a risk as a man uh, in this present company, but my question, Anne, is to do with the statements you made about narcissism in our society at the moment. Uh, or up, you know, not just at the moment, that it's been in our society for a while, it does seem to me as an observer 
that there has been a great upswing in the last uh, 20, 30 years of uh, business that's concerned with women's appearance and women's, uh, uh, how women look uh, about themselves and how they dress. So in the small town that I live in, there's a multitude now of women's dress shops which seem to be well, uh, um, seem to be a main part of the business. I'm just wondering whether uh, perhaps a positive thing in society is this uh, great surge of interest in by women and ability to pursue it, uh, to uh, look at themselves and make themselves look good. Uh, it, do you think that's a, a factor in the narcissistic part of society and a good one possibly or a bad one possibly? I'm glad you've just justified my habit of online shopping for clothes, so <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, look, I think um, that with respect to... Right, I just want to introduce an, an, another idea here, which has been a really standard argument within psychotherapy and within psychology, that everyone has a need of what they call healthy narcissism. Um, I think the term healthy narcissism is confusing to people, so um, I argue in my book that we should use other kind of words. But the, some of the things they mean uh, by healthy narcissism is um, the uh, ability to uh, exhibit yourself. Here we are on the stage, we are exhibiting ourselves, and it requires a bit of confidence and a bit of chutzpah to do that and, and stand up and do it. Um, it. Women in particular, historically, have been held away from the public realm, so they do need the um, ability to be will, you know, willing to, um, uh, to get up in, in public and, and perform, and that's a really uh, encouraging and, and admirable aspect of modern society. Uh, with respect to appearance, um, I, some of the other things that, that might come forth in, under healthy narcissism would be um, not, not just to do with appearance, but uh, self-efficacy, a sense of confidence, um, a willingness to assert yourself against a bully, uh, a, uh, a pride in what you do and a pride in, in, in your achievements and uh, not always um, you know, hiding your light under a bushel, um, but, you know, but being able to take pleasure, uh, including um, the enjoyment of one's own um, success, because often there's, uh, there can be the opposite of narcissism as an unwillingness. So we're coming back to the, the clothing question, um, I think that partly it's just a much more affluent society, so everyone has a great deal more of everything, and so there are going to be not only more dress shops in those, those countries. I'm astonished when I go back to my country town how many cafes and chocolate shops and, you know, the, um, all very attractive. It's very enjoyable, um, uh, but it's, it's also part of a consumer culture. And, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do with this book was... Uh, to get behind the uh, Pollyanna version of the consumer society, the version you know that comes out of say the Australian newspaper or, or some such, but you know that is that there are there are deeper and darker things that go on with um, a continual consumption, and which go into the forming of an identity. Um, so I think. Uh, to do with uh, female appearance, but it's even uh, male appearance now too. There's a lot of anxiety about it, and I think that there's a lot, uh, there's a tightening of our opinions about what um, our bodies should look like, uh, and much more um, pu uh, uh, at the punitiveness that used to be around sexuality is much more targeted um, to the body and you know what we we look like. I think we've got time for this one up the front here. Thanks. Um, as a psychotherapist, I often have uh, people come in who they might have been diagnosed with a very mild clinical depression, for example. But what you're seeing is rather a kind of despair that they'll describe in terms of their experience of the world that sounds like a relationship with a narcissist. And it's not just the unempathic kind of bullying side of the world, it's very much that, but also the kind of um, bereft side of the world because, on the other hand, there's no nurturance there. Yes, yes. And so an important part of um, that work is, 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 is helping people to you know, address both those sides of their experience of the world because we're very social creatures, obviously. And so there's a real challenge to, f to work with their despair, to push back mm. against the despair or overcome despair or however you want to put it. Mm. 
Now obviously I have my own ways of, you know, sort of trying to help people with that, but I'm interested in, in some of your thoughts on, 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 on how one goes about addressing that. Well, thank you for that lovely question. I, I, I agree with you absolutely, and one of the themes which comes through um, so strongly and one of the great dangers if we have a society which becomes more narcissistic is that inability to swing your attention to someone when they need it, um, not when you feel like it, um, and to give them the nurturance you know, that they need. Um, and thank you also for pointing out the despair of people who are at the receiving end of someone who is um, so self-absorbed. Uh, uh, someone gave me an example um, at an event where their mother would talk at them about herself. And at one point, this daughter decided to actually say what her job was. You know, she was an adult, she'd been in this job for a long time and had never, the mother had never quite gotten on to the fact that she had this new job. So she said what it was and the husband had actually challenged her and said, oh, I don't think um, you're, you know, you can't be serious that she's not going to be interested in that. Um, and so he was then present, but then she, the mother just kept talking. Uh, you know, just paused briefly for the intermission and then kept going. So there's a, a very strong um, uh, uh, kind of de sense of desertion, I think, in when someone's having a, a relationship with someone like that. Um, but, you know, other than stepping away um, and other than the narcissist himself going into therapy, which, as you know, we, you would know as a therapist, is very difficult because they, um, something I didn't mention earlier, it's, it, therapy is possible for someone with narcissism, but it's difficult because they re regard themselves as so superior um, and kind of perfect or already great that they will be extremely threatened by any kind of interventions or, you know, the, what the psychotherapist says. Um, but beyond um, uh, helping that person f begin to feel entitled to claim things in the next relationship um, seems to me the important, you know, because, and that's where I think, uh, you know, o often we, we the, the, the ways in which people need to be able to feel that their needs are legitimate and that it is, it is reasonable and right to be able to make claims on each other, um, you know, that is what the larger culture has, you know, we have to try and um, get some kind of, um, reorientation in the culture towards that such that you know that the, the person you're seeing is um is able to recognize and identify and name what it is that they're at the receiving end of much sooner than getting really immersed and in enmeshed with such a person this book thanks you all for coming out tonight and please thank Anne Mann for joining us <laughs> <laughs>